Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel and for those who are new here, please don't forget to subscribe for more updates in neurology and today we are going to be talking about an important central nervous system demyelinating disorder that is MOG antibody associated disease. So what does MOG stand for? So MOG stands for myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein and antibodies to this myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein is responsible for MOG antibody associated disease and this disease can affect both children as well as adults and around 25 to 50 percentage of cases are because of pediatric patients and both males and female patients are affected equally and it's very common for MOGA to present as a para-infectious or a para-vaccination phenomenon so it's vital that we ask history for antecedent infections as well as immunizations and another classical feature of MOGA is it has excellent response to steroids and next coming to the disease course so 50% of the patients are going to have a monophasic illness and another 50 are going to have a relapsing illness. But remember that unlike multiple sclerosis, progressive forms are not seen. So when it comes to NMOSD, so when it comes to NMOSD, this is a usually a relapsing illness. It's very unusual for NMOSD, NMOSD to either be progressive or be monophasic. But when it comes to MOGAD, it can either be monophasic or it can be a relapsing illness. But remember that both NMSD and MOGAD are very unlikely to have progressive forms. Progressive forms are usually seen in multiple sclerosis. Now coming to the spectrum of involvement. So MOGAD can either present with optic neuritis, transverse myelitis or it can present as an ADEM that is an acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and this is usually seen in the pediatric population. And another entity is known as cerebral cortical encephalitis. So let's go into each of these. So first coming to the optic nerve involvement. So first have a look at this image here, a pictorial representation of the optic neuritis seen in MOGAD. So number one, we can see that there is bilateral involvement. There is bilateral involvement. Number two, you can see that there's a significant length of the optic nerve that is involved. Definitely it is more than 50% of the optic nerve length. The third thing we can see is there is a predominant anterior optic pathway involvement. Predominantly, it's involved in the anterior parts of the optic pathway and it also classically can involve the optic nerve heads and this is going to present as papillitis. This is going to present as papillitis. And another unique radiological feature is the pattern of enhancement and this is known as the optic nerve sheath enhancement. So it can present with optic nerve sheath enhancement or perineural enhancement pattern or perineural enhancement pattern. And this pattern is clearly seen here. This is an MRI orbit contrast images and you can see there is a perineural contrast enhancement or a optic nerve sheath enhancement. So just to summarize, it's going to be bilateral, severe, predominantly anterior optic pathway involvement with optic disc edema or papillitis. It may or may not be associated with retinal hemorrhage. Another feature is around uh, some of the patients with MOGAD associated optic neuritis can have a preceding severe frontal and periorbital pain and usually how they will present is they'll have a severe headache and two days later they'll present with a full-blown optic neuritis and blindness and as we discussed more than 50 percent of the optic nerve length is involved and a classical enhancement pattern that is the perineural enhancement pattern so this is about the optic nerve involvement now let's go to the spinal cord involvement so first have a look at the images here. This is a pictorial representation of the spinal cord and the first image is the T2 images. So you can see that there is a longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. Why? Because there is more than three contiguous vertebral segments being involved. And if you look at the axial images, if you see the axial images, there is a predilection to involve the gray matter of the spinal cord. It's a predilection to involve the gray matter of the spinal cord and this appears as the H sign. This appears as the H sign on the axial MRI images and the third feature that we can see is there's a predilection to involve the conus medullaris this is a very unique feature of MOGAD associated transverse myelitis so it can involve the conus medullaris next coming to the second image that is the contrast images so only around 50 percentage of the cases will have contrast enhancement and also there is a unique contrast pattern which is known as the leptomeningeal enhancement so they can have lepto, spinal leptomeningeal enhancement. So this is well seen in this image over here. Just have a look at this MRI. You can see there is a smooth spinal 
leptomeningeal enhancement which is seen in the contrast images. So just to summarize, the lesions are quite fainter, it can present with LETM that is three or more contiguous vertebral segments being involved and additionally they can be coexisting shorter myelitis lesions. There is predominant central grey matter involvement and this is going to present as the H sign on the axial MRI images. There is also a predilection to involve the conus medullaris. Only 50% of the cases are going to have gadolinium enhancement and also there is a unique pattern of enhancement that is your subtle spinal leptomeningeal enhancement. Subtle spinal leptomeningeal enhancement. So this is about the spinal cord involvement. Now let's go into the brain and brainstem involvement. So these first four images are flare images and the last one is the contrast images. So let's have the flare images first. So this pattern you can see over here is diffuse brainstem involvement. The patient has diffuse brainstem involvement. And if you see in the second image you can see that the patient has involvement of bilateral, middle, middle cerebellar peduncles. So this MCP involvement is a very unique radiological marker of MOGAD. Next coming to the other involvement, the patient can have cortical and subcortical involvement and also has a predilection to involve the deep grey matter. Deep grey matter like the thalamus and basal ganglia. And you have another entity that is known as cerebral cortical encephalitis cerebral cortical encephalitis so you can see that here the patient has T2 flare hyperintensities involving the cortical surface unilaterally and on the corresponding contrast images you can see that there is an overlying smooth meningeal enhancement so this entity is known as cerebral cortical encephalitis. So just to summarize, the patient is going to have large fluffy lesions which are poorly demarcated. There can be diffuse brainstem involvement. There can be involvement of the middle cerebellar peduncles which is quite unique. The patient can have involvement of the subcortical grey matter like thalamus and basal ganglia. And you can also have what is known as the cerebral cortical encephalitis. So now we've discussed about the spectrum of involvement in MOGAD. Now let's come to the diagnostic criteria. So for the diagnostic criteria, we need to know what are the six core clinical features that is seen in MOGAD. So number one is optic neuritis. Number two is myelitis. Number three is ADAM that is acute dissimulated encephalomyelitis. Myelitis. Number four is cerebral monofocal or polyfocal deficits without encephalopathy. Number five is brainstem or cerebellum involvement. And number six is the cerebral cortical encephalitis that we discussed earlier. So remember that if the patient is anti mock positive, you just need to have one of these core clinical characteristics to satisfy the criteria. But before that, it's not just being positive, you also have to check for the MOG IgG titers. So in case the patient has a clear cut serum MOG IgG positivity, that is titers of more than 1 is to 100, that time you don't need any other supporting features to make the diagnosis. One core clinical feature, any week, uh, very, uh, clear serum MOG positivity, nothing else is needed. But if the patient has a low serum MOG IgG positivity, that is titers from 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 100, or if the patient has a positive MOG antibody report, but we don't know what the titers are, the lab hasn't reported the titer values. Or number three, if the patient has an isolated MOG positivity in the CSF, so serum is negative, serum is negative but the CSF anti-MOG antibody is positive. So in these circumstances you need to have certain additional things that needs to be satisfied. Number one the patient's acoporin 4 antibody test should be negative and number two the patient should have at least one supporting clinical or MRI feature. So what are these supporting features? We'll have a look at it right now. So the supporting features is just what we discussed now. The patient should have an optic neuritis which is bilateral more than 50% involvement with perineural enhancement and papillitis. Or the patient should have a classical imaging features of myelitis with the LETM, classical your central cord sign or the H sign or a conus medullaris involvement. Next, brain and brainstem involvement either in the form of multiple supratentorial and infratentorial lesions, presence of deep grey matter involvement and ill-defined T2 hyperintensities involving the pons, middle cerebellar peduncle or medulla or if the patient has imaging features which is consistent with cerebral cortical encephalitis. And the last thing is the patient should have exclusion of alternative diagnosis including multiple sclerosis. So this is a little different from the Wingerchuk criteria that is used in NMOSD. So basically the thing is, remember the six core clinical features, at least one should be positive. If there's a clear cut mock positivity, nothing else is needed. But if it is a low positive or you don't have the titers, you need to satisfy at least one of the additional features. 
Now coming to the investigation. So MRA we have already discussed how the patterns of involvement are going to be. I'm not going to going into that again. Now coming to the CSF analysis. So unlike multiple sclerosis, around 35 percentage of patients with MOGAD are going to have marked pleocytosis of more than 50 cells. And mostly they're going to be lymphocytes. But remember that you can additionally have neutrophils and eosinophils. And I've already emphasized this for the acoporin 4 antibodies. I'm doing it again for the anti-MOG antibodies. You have to make sure it is done by cell-based assay. And for MOG, additionally, you have to check for the titus. So a clear-cut positivity is going to be more than 1 is to 100. 1 is to 10 to 1 is to 100 is going to be low positive. Now, how are you going to treat MOGAD? So it's very similar to NMOST. The only thing you have to remember is MOGAD is exquisitely steroid responsive. It's going to respond excellently to steroids. So here we're going to give pulse steroids, injection methylprednisolone at a dose of 1 gram IVOD given over 5 to 7 days and followed by an oral steroid dose that is tablet prednisolone 1 mg per kg. But remember, please don't taper it rapidly as you would do for multiple sclerosis. Please continue the full dose of steroids that is 1 mg per kg at least up to a few weeks and even up to 12 weeks Reassess the clinical scenario. If the patient is clinically stable, that time you can slowly taper at a rate of 5 mg every 2 weeks. Remember that it's very unusual for MOGA to be steroid unresponsive, but if, if that is the case, you might have to go for plasma exchange or intravenous immunoglobulin. And remember that whenever you have a patient with transverse myelitis who is worsening with steroids, you have to consider either an infectious myelitis or a spinal a, a spinal dural AV fistula. So these are the two entities which will present as a myelitis and will worsen with steroids. Now coming to prophylaxis. So prophylaxis in MOGAD is a little bit more tricky coming to uh, compared to NMOST because we know that NMOST by nature is universally going to be a recurrent illness. So after treating the acute attack for NMOSD, we are obviously going to start prophylactic agents. Number two, there are no approved prophylactic medications for MOGAD. Most of them are just used off-label. So no approved drugs. And the problem is 50% of the patients with MOGAD are going to be monophasic. NMSD is recurrent, so you have to give prophylactic agents, but 50% of MOGAD cases are monophasic. So 50% of patients, you shouldn't unnecessarily give them prophylactic agents or immunosuppressive medications. So who do we give them? Number one, if the patient has a second attack. So if the patient has a second attack, that time you can consider prophylactic medications. Number two, if the patient has an incomplete clinical recovery from the first attack, then also you can consider. And also please don't forget to monitor the MOG antibody along with the titers periodically. In case the titers, in case the titers are in a falling trend, it usually says that the patient has a very significantly low risk of developing a relapse. So in case you are going to give prophylactic medications, what are the medications that you're going to give? So you can try the similar drugs that are used for NMOST. So you can try rituximab, azathioprine, mycophenolate mofetil, your anti-IL-6 agents like tocilizumab and sertralizumab. And there is also some evidence for periodic IVAG infusions. There is an ongoing trial. There is an ongoing trial for roxanolixizumab. And this is actually approved for myasthenia gravis. This is a inhibitor of the neonatal FC receptor. It's still not approved. This trial is still ongoing. And you also have a similar ongoing uh, trial for acoporumab for NMOSD. This is also not re released yet. There's a trial which is ongoing. So this is about the treatment, management and patterns of involvement in MOGAD. So we'll meet in the next video.